Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast, sponsored by Reps VR, First Down Playbook, Rack Coach, Tip the Spear, the Top Hopper, and Sports Workbook. Today we have a treat. We have Mario Price, a, a real podcaster, unlike myself. I can't even keep my schedule straight. I messed up Cody Alexander. I messed up Mario's day. So, I mean, I'm just glad I got people that are smarter than me and looking out for me. So, Coach, thank you for coming on. I mean, you're the head of the AFCA education, and that is just awesome. I mean, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Coach, and where you're from. Yeah, man. So I, I grew up in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And thank you, by the way, man. I appreciate the opportunity thank you. on the show. Uh, but, yeah, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, you know, Got a, got a taste of the big time uh, <laughs> under the lights, Friday night lights. Uh, you know, up here in the DFW area, and um, you know, out of high school, it, I got an opportunity to play defensive back o- over at Army. Had a few uh, college offers, and uh, really, I fell in love with the head coach there, and uh, went up played foot my college football my first year at West Point, and um, it was it was kind of an interesting experience. Like I said, I loved the coach, uh, wasn't necessarily in love with with everything that kind of came along with it and uh, ended up transferring out after one year. Uh, and this part of my kind of story or my journey is important because the head coach at the time was uh, Todd Barry, um, who, you know, fast forward, he's the executive director here at the AFCA. Um, but, you know, played one year for, for him and then I transferred over to Baylor. I wanted to get back on the offensive side of the ball and, uh, you know, I transferred over, played running back, uh, spent four years under Guy Morris. Um, Brent Pease was offensive coordinator. Uh, uh, Lee Hayes came in my senior year, was our offensive coordinator, uh, and, and played on some good coaches. Had a, a, a fantastic uh, opportunity, of, uh, a really good career, and uh, you know something I was proud of. And you know, I didn't necessarily want to get into coaching as I started college, but towards the, tw- uh, the, the tail end of my my journey, I you know was always super into the playbooks, uh, understanding techniques. I wanted to know what things were called, uh, you know would learn the playbook super fast and all those kind of things that, you know, a lot of coaches to kind of, kind of, kind of tend to do. And, uh, anyways, once I was kind of done, um, I did a camp and, uh, uh with our director of football operations, who's head coach here in Texas now, Dale James, and, uh, got to meet the, the head football coach at Winkle high school. And, you know, he's asking what I was going to do moving forward. And, uh, he had an opportunity that kind of just arose. It was the 13th hour type deal. I was, I was trying to see what I was going to do next. And, uh, as you know, I ended up on the sideline, there at Waco High School, and uh, you know, the first job I actually was working at a feeder at a feeder middle school and helping out with the high school, and I uh, absolutely just fell in love with the profession, man. And uh, spent three years at the high school level, um, and my 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 coach got Morris, uh, rest in peace. He just passed here uh, not too long ago. Um, he he gave me a shout, and he had, he he was let go from Baylor after our, the season after I left, um, and took over the head job at Texas A&M Commerce, and uh, he had a receiver position open. And, uh, you know, I, I, I knew that I probably wanted a little bit more than, than, than the high school level. Um, but, you know, I, I was kind of knocking on the doors and making sure the opportunity was right. But uh, when Don Morris called, I accepted the position and, uh, and started my collegiate journey. And I coached wide receivers at Texas m Commerce for two years. Um, had the opportunity to take a D3 job. I really wanted to get under somebody and I, I took it over this, this the current position I had had I just wanted to get around some different coaches get some different philosophy just really expand my network and I uh, went over to Millsaps College over in Jackson Mississippi or spent a year there uh got some valuable experience you know uh, not a lot of people on staff so you had to, had to wear a lot of hats all that good stuff and then uh had the opportunity to re, you know during my time as I'm trying to continue to expand my network I, I give all these coaches I played for that you know been, now are spread all across the country and, and uh Todd Barry responded back to one of my emails and you know like I said I played for him just for probably less than 365 days and uh you know he responded back to me and said hey man look I might have a graduate assistant position that might come open man just uh I'll keep you in the loop and he gave me a call not uh, pretty quickly and I end up uh going over there as a graduate assistant um started off working with the receivers I was promoted within two or three months, the full-time role, coaching the inside receivers. And then uh, really got to blossom and grow there. Uh, promoted again, recruiting coordinator, started working with special teams more, moved over to the running backs uh, role. And uh, we ended up there for about four years and our staff was let go. Uh, Todd Barry took over the American Football Coaches Association as executive director as uh, Grant Taft left. And I took a job at, at Davidson College over in North Carolina, uh, FCS 
uh, non non scholarship program. And uh, once again, a valuable experience. Uh, uh, love that staff there. Stay in great contact with them. I did a year there as a running backs coach, special team coordinator, and uh, coach gave me a shout and said, "Hey, man, the AFC is in Waco. That's kind of where you where you did your time, and uh, you know you've always been passionate about the profession. Yada 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 yada." You know, let's do this. So it was a tough decision to make, but uh, man, I got here and uh, definitely have missed missed a lot of about, a lot about the profession, but just been able to kind of be in close proximity with all these coaches via the podcast, via getting guys to speak. You know, whatever it's it's, it's been so rewarding, and hopefully, I've left a positive uh, impact in, in the profession. Yeah, man, and I've, I've enjoyed listening uh, to your podcast. So, like, since you've been doing the podcast, we talked off the air. Um, can you tell a story about how you started the podcast and, you know, what you've learned, Coach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, kind of as I mentioned, I guess it will pick up a little bit of kind of where it ended is you know, I had I had this abrupt end into this coaching career. You know, I, just like most other people, I wanted to coach at the best program and be the head coach at some point in time. And I just had this really short time frame to make a, a life changing decision. And so. Like I said, I did, I didn't miss a ton of it. And uh, oftentimes I just ended up on the phone with, you know, guys I work with, guys I, you know, built some really good relationships with. And, you know, your guys just on the road out recruiting, you know, <laughs> telling them, like, hey, man, I just left this high school. You can't believe what happened. And I was like, man, you know what? This would be pretty decent little 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 podcast if, you know, kind of, you know, to just talk to coaches randomly and, uh, you know, let, let them tell their story and talk about, you know, whatever's going on in their life. You know, it didn't have much direction, but uh, literally at kind of like mine yeah, <laughs> yeah. no direction that's right man and I, and, and there was literally no direction I, I i walked into my ga's office i said hey man bring your podcast stuff tomorrow we're recording a podcast and caught up a good friend of mine he's the offensive coordinator over at where is he at right now uh he was at jacksonville state at the time i can't recall where he is right now but anyways he's he uh yeah cody wells and just gave him a shout man and we just we just chopped it up about a bunch of nothing it was probably i I have yet to go back and listen to it because I, I can only imagine how bad it was quality wise and direction wise. But uh, anyways, man, we just chopped it up. And then every week we just start getting guys on and we just decided we were going to stay committed to that. And, uh, and we went from talking X's and O's a lot and philosophies to pretty much now the podcast kind of has an identity now where we go and get coaches on. And we we just talk about their their, their coaching career, their coaching trajectory, everything that's kind of happened, why they got into it, who's impacted them, um, all those kind of things. And uh you know, you know, you asked about what I learned. I think, I think the biggest thing I learned, probably, probably early on doing the podcast, was, man, you know, what we do is important. Uh, you know, what we do as coaches is is so important. I think a lot of times you get so caught up in maybe some of your personal goals, and man, I yeah, I can't wait to be offensive coordinator at X university or X high school or get my first head coaching job. And you know, regardless of where you at, man, there's there's a bunch of young people that are looking up to you and need direction and. Uh, you know, the things that you do and the things that you say, they're going to hold on to for the rest of their lives. And I think you know that, but when all of a sudden I have a podcast and I'm talking to, you know, the receivers guy at University of Michigan and in the next podcast, I'm talking to a, you know, assistant coach at a high school in Alaska and their impact doesn't change. It doesn't matter. You know, one's probably getting paid way more than the other one's on TV every weekend. But when it's all said and done, you know, the impact, the main thing is the main thing. For both of those guys and so it's just been something i've, I've truly appreciated and I, I you know i don't really get caught up in name dropping and things like that because uh you know on that podcast man i, I don't care who's on there i want to talk to you i want to hear about your story because it's amazing um and you're doing you know great things whoever you are so uh you know it was a point in time where it's like man hey i want to get this guy on he's 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 mm-hmm. the man in this and it's like now nah, i don't care you want to be on a podcast come on let's hop on let's talk and let's see uh you know what coach out there that you can impact and you can help by telling your story. Yeah. So who who's been your favorite guest? Maybe not your biggest, uh, you know, name, but who's been your favorite? Yeah, man. You know. Yeah. So I let, let let me say this because you you asked this question. If you asked this about a month ago, I would I would give you a a, a totally different answer. But uh, <laughs> Maurice Linkwood. So he was a teammate of mine at Baylor. Um, mm-hmm. and so. Hey, coach uh, of Buffalo. Head, is it, hey, head coach of Buffalo. So me and him were same class. I went to the uh, military academy. He went to uh, Air Force Academy out of high school. We both transferred to Baylor. We're like, so we were longtime friends and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of grew up in the profession together. And so uh, he actually just joined the board uh, as a representative uh, from, from the MAC 
And so the board actually came down to Waco here a couple weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we sat down and he was like, hey, you're here, man. Let's go into the studio. Let's rip off the podcast. And so that by far was just the, the funnest and the most rewarding one. Just uh, probably a little bit more on a personal level, just seeing how much he he's grown as a, you know, guy we're running – <laughs> running down the field on kickoff together years ago and, you know, going heads up in practice to, to just this tremendous leader, um, you know, a, a fantastic father, all those types of things. So uh, that one was really special. And it was, uh, you know, we got to spend a lot more time than we typically do on a podcast. So, man, that, that one was really good. I, I enjoyed that one. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of his because Jim McNally. Okay. Jim McNally is alumni of Buffalo and he loves uh, – Coach Linquist and the job that they're doing up there, um, but before Coach, who would you have said a month ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but yeah, forgot about that part. Mike London, uh, head coach. Of, oh, uh, I love him. Mary. So, man, he's the best. Yeah, and and so I know a lot of people kind of know him about what he's done. You know, whether it's the ACC, William Mary University of Richmond, and you know, just just been a championship coach from an X and O standpoint. But uh, and his story is, is crazy. He's a, he was a police officer coming hmm. out. Uh, you know, that was uh, staring down the barrel of a gun, the guy pulled the trigger, the bullet didn't come out, and you know, he made a big change. And uh, how important his family is to him, you know, he had some issues with his daughter from a health standpoint, so he's gotten extremely involved with Be the Match and Andy Talley, old villain overhead coach that is uh, you know, huge into the like the bone marrow transplant donors and things like that. So, uh, you know, when you Pull up, you know, pull back all the championships and all the, you know, all the winning and all that kind of stuff, man. He's just a human that has an absolutely amazing story and is super passionate about his family and, um, you know, the end of profession. So that was definitely my favorite one for a long time. Yeah, he, Mike Lennon's the best. I've known him since, I mean, I get, he was on Al Gro's first staff at UVA. And then, you know, he went to be the head coach at Richmond, head coach at UVA and, He's been all over the place, and he's always been a great friend of mine. And yeah. he, I mean, he's from Virginia, so I, I'm. You're from you're from Texas, coach, right? So I mean, I'm from Virginia. I love Texas high school football, coach. Talk about Texas high school football. I had Texas high school football chat on, um, and just how important is football in Texas? Yeah, man, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, especially when you start representing an organization like this. And you got coaches from all over. I, I try to be careful about how I talk about, you know, certain things. I don't always want to make it sound like that I'm, you know, putting putting a certain place on a pedestal or anything like that, man. But 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 growing up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, you know, one of one of one of the meccas of, of just high school football, man, it was it was it was extremely evident. And probably more as I start moving around the coaching profession and uh you know, to take a job and I'm, man, hey, man, I'm, I'm a big time college coach. And then I go to a high school in Texas and it's like, damn, their facilities are better than what, you know, what we got. How are we going to get this kid to come play for us when, uh, you know, they 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 got a, you know, 12,000 seat stadium. We got a 2000 seat stadium and, uh, you know, their locker room is nice than ours. And just so just how much they invest in, in, in athletics across the board in the state of Texas, but more specifically uh, football. I think that's that's kind of where you see the major difference. You see the the, the head coaching salaries just been, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, been in the six figure range. And, um, you know, my brother's a head coach here uh, down in the Austin area. And um, just the just amount of resources they pour into the programs from a, from a uh, strength and conditioning standpoint, from a facility standpoint, I, I think it just kind of further and further kind of keeps that thing on the forefront of athletics now. Um, I've recruited all over the Deep South, and I found some of the most tremendous talent in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama. You know, so I, I think when it comes down to it, you're you got athletes everywhere, you got great coaching everywhere. But once again, when you start talking about the financial resources that kind of go into it, how important it is to the community and, uh, and all the communities across the, the state in Texas, I think uh, I think that's where you start seeing the humongous difference. Yeah, and I talked to these coaches from Florida, coach, and like. You know, Uncle Luke, he said that the high school coaches don't get paid anything in Florida. And then I talked to um, the recruiting analyst at UNLV. Um, and he said that when he was a high school coach, they didn't make anything. So, like, is the state of Florida, are they like, do they take it, do they take it for granted that they just have great athletes and great players and then 
the money isn't put into the coaching salaries like it is in Texas. And uh, you know, I, I, it wouldn't be fair for me to speak on exactly how that works out. To be honest with you, uh, you know, I, I know it's important down there. Uh, you know, uh, we we actually did a little series as we were just trying to figure things out with the podcast where we had a, a high school coach, Coach Stralo from uh, Keller High School. He spent he, he would come every week and kind of talk about his week, what they did game plan wise, how how the, how the game went, etc. And he actually started his coaching career off. He was a, he's a Florida guy, started his coaching career off in Florida, man. It was important, man. And I mean, he's he was so passionate about it. And I know all the coaches I've ever you know had the had the pleasure of encountering all the student athletes that come from there. I know I know how important it is. You know, I don't I don't know if it's a resource issue, whatever it is, but uh, you know, it just hadn't hadn't got to that point yet. And I think uh, I think when it does get to the point where facilities match and um, you know you know pay matches, I mean. It'd be hard. It'd be hard to not say Florida is just producing <laughs> consistently some of the best athletes. That has been always one of the, the great advantages of uh, you know recruiting Florida is you come and you get a fantastic, a fantastic athlete that's well coached, but the ceiling is still so high because they they don't have the weight room exposure that maybe a kid from Texas does. They don't have the nutrition and you know just some of the stuff that some of these programs have, and um, you know you can come in there and, and, and take advantage of that and see these kids just continue to excel. What advice would you give a coach who wants to start a podcast, coach? You know, I, I think uh, just like anything from a content creation standpoint, is getting extremely saturated with, you know, just 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 tons of people that if you got a computer, you can pretty much do anything you want from a content standpoint. So, uh, you know, find your niche. Find, find something that is very, very specific, maybe to you, maybe to something that's important to you. Um, and, and, and go grab somebody and say, Hey, record this, just kind of, kind of like what I did. Um, and, and, and just see what sticks, um, uh, you know, don't be afraid to get out there and, and, uh, you know, be criticized and, uh, you know, you just have people putting their comments on what you do. Just go out there and have some conviction about what it is. Um, and like I said, once again, just make sure you try to find a niche rather than trying to do something very general. Cause it does get, does get difficult when you try to go that route and, and just give it a rip. You know, by no means do I feel like I'm a podcast expert, but I know I'm an expert at the inside the headset podcast. And that's all I want to be an expert at. Um, and, and I'm going to do a good job with what we do. And I would encourage you, if you, you know, you, even you as, as you're doing it, but you as a listener, um, if that's something that you want to do, sit down and just be passionate about what you do. Yeah. I mean, we started this in January, coach, and I don't even know how I got here talking to you, coach. I mean, you're the head of the education for the AFCA. And, I mean, that's pretty important, Coach. I mean, the AFCA is a, a huge organization, and it's pretty much all the coaches in the country from high school to college, maybe in, even NFL. So talk a little bit about the AFCA, Coach, and what your role is. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm the director of coaching education. Uh, the American Football Coaches Association kind of initially built years and years ago for uh, specifically for collegiate coaches. Uh, it was just an opportunity for guys to kind of get together, you know, talk about what they do, uh, talk about how they're impacting their kids. And uh, over time, it, it kind of grew into this deal where uh, we have 100% of the NFL coaches are part of the association. But wow. that scheduling kind of the turn, uh, turn around, you typically don't see those guys there because at this point now, they're actually still playing that last uh, week 16 game or 17, however they call it. Um, they're playing that last game that weekend. Um, so, you know, we, uh, here and there you get some coaches that come, but they're all actually a part of it. Uh, they were, they kind of got to deal with the NFL. They, they they pay for every coach to be a part of the association, receive the magazines, you know, get get all the membership benefits. Um, and then the high school has been a marquee part of it. Um, you know, tons of coaches from, you know, been been doing a lot of our, uh, our, our conventions there in San Antonio. So we have a huge Texas population that, makes it super important to be a part of that you know we do a ton in nashville tennessee area um so all those tennessee area coaches are a big part of it um all that deep south florida you know the the, the states that can kind of get in the car and just rip over and drive and the east coast has been been phenomenal and uh and we do have, also have a lot of coaches that aren't part of association from a high school level so you know we're, we're, we're actually wrapping up some outreach just to get guys to be, become more educated on it the time is not great for any high school coach, unfortunately, because it, it kind of interferes with that first week. If you're doing multiple sports, you might got basketball or wrestling going on, depending on where you are in the country, um, you know, lacrosse, whatever. So uh, we 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 we're trying to continue to grow our high school uh, membership, but we still we still have a large 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 number of uh, 
high school coaches that are part of our association. Now, what I do is I'm responsible for our education. Um, anything that you see probably from a social media standpoint, any articles that you see in a magazine that are related to X's and O's, related to um, you know the, the, the power of influence that we have as coaches, um, that that's going to be something that not necessarily I generated as a, as a human, but I'm going to you know call up a coach and say, hey, look, man, I want you to put some together, you know, you know, dart, uh, run play, um, and we're going to throw it in our magazine. And then you know, once we kind of go through the season, I'm <clears throat> keeping a decent eye out on who's have who's doing well, you know, uh, who, who's in kind of some unique situations. How can we create some programming that's going to get coaches uh, excited about coming to the convention and uh, excited about learning ball? And um, <clears throat> so I'm responsible for getting all the speakers. Here recently, we actually added a skills and drills uh, segment to our to our uh, convention. That was kind of an idea, which interestingly enough, I had as a coach. I would always say, man, it would be super cool instead of having this guy, you know, standing at the front talking about how they do the drills, you know, so setting some up where – they could actually do the drill. And I said that in 2014, you know, as, as just a young receivers coach or something like that. And uh, all of a sudden, never knowing I'd be in a position to kind of kind of get that get that going and let seeing it come to fruition. And so, you know, we, we've tried to be unique with our approach and uh, kind of bring the AFCA up today that Coach Barry has been an innovative uh, offensive mind. Uh, if you don't know much about it from an offensive standpoint, I mean, it's just so much cool stuff I learned under him. And once we kind of got in this role, we, we want to be innovative. We want to have a podcast, which I know is not that innovative at this point in time. But, you know, we were one of the relatively early on that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, creating a digital library, you know, creating some more interesting uh, uh, um, programming from an educational standpoint. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've just been trying to grow and keep up with the game and try to find ways to, to meet coaches where they are. And, uh, you know, that, that's pretty much my role, man. A big part of the AFCA is the convention. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about what was your first convention and any <laughs> stories yeah. you may have, Coach? Um, yeah, so, that, you know, convention. if you listen to the podcast enough, uh, then, then you know that's actually one of my uh, – that's one of my go-to questions when I, get a, when I get a head coach on for sure is to kind of reflect back on that first convention because it's I, I think anybody that's ever been to one – story is probably pretty similar for everybody you uh you know my first one was in in, in dallas uh one of the few ones they did in dallas it was a snowy one so I, it was it, it was a bad experience kind of when i look back on it because we were driving over from uh commerce uh back and forth and um you know the world the worlds were slippery so i missed a lot more programming than i would like but uh still got to see a ton of stuff but uh, my first experience i remember walking in there and i saw larry coker larry coker at the time is head coach in Miami and uh or you know I think actually he wasn't head coach in Miami he was a head coach somewhere else but like he was he was a rock star to me as a as a young as a as a younger coach and uh collegiate athlete and I just remember seeing Larry Coker and I looked and I saw Stoops and uh Spurrier and I'm seeing all these guys that you know TV even legend even, yeah yeah you know TV even at that time was a little different than what it is now at this point you can almost if you want to watch a college football game you can go and go to ESPN plus and find the Stony Brook versus, you know, whoever. But at this point in time, it, you know, it, all you saw on TV was the, the big time teams. And just to be able to see those guys, you know, alive and living color and, and seeing all the coaches, you know, running up to them, shaking their hand. And uh, it was, it was a little intimidating to be honest with you. And I, I'm not scared to kind of put myself out there, but I remember just kind of looking at myself saying, man, can I do this? Can I, can I, yeah. And I get one of those receiver jobs on that staff because they're only taking one. Maybe they have an inside receiver guy. only taking two. How 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 am I going to navigate through this profession when there's so many people that know so much stuff? Um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm in there and I'm shaking hands with guys that coach me that I looked up to saying, hey, man, if you're hearing anything, let me know. We were let go at our <laughs> university. And you're like, God, ladies, you know, this profession is crazy. And, you know, as I kind of went to more and more of those and, you know, I'm starting to get calls from guys that I looked up, up to in the industry saying, hey, man, I see you've got a, a, a running back job open over there. Can you can you help me out? And, uh, you know, it was it, it was cool, man. It was always uh, it was always cool going to that next one, knowing a few more people, knowing a little bit more football, knowing uh, that I'm a little bit better of a coach than I was the last time, you know, that I was around. And so, uh yeah, man, that first one was special, and it's even more special every year that passed. I can look back on it and see how far that I that I came, and um, you know, you know how many more people that I know, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's definitely a special experience. 
where is next year's convention coach? And if a coach is not a member and they chose to go to the convention, I've always said the AFCA convention is, it's like the father of all clinics. I mean, it is the biggest, I mean, exactly how much can you, a coach learn how many different speakers can they listen to yeah what's what's the time frame explain to somebody who has never been to one coach yeah 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 so it's uh you know i i, I know glazier and uh you know our nike coach here they do a tremendous job of just kind yeah. of getting out and, and actually going uh to all these different places and having a bunch going on simultaneously obviously we're different uh we, we have one annual marquee convention per year and uh it's typically three to four days and uh it goes sunday to about tuesday or wednesday just kind of depending on the year and um you know just me being responsible for getting the speakers i know every year i have to go and kind of put the numbers together we're, we're around 200 different speakers and they're going to talk about absolutely everything under the sun that you can think of from you know positional you know across the board every last position uh we're gonna, now we have the skills and drill segment where they're not just doing position stuff but they're actually going through their drills with uh we used to use live athletes, the NIL kind of kind of threw that in a in a whirlwind, but we actually get some of our young coaches to come and be athletes for the for the guys just so that you can talk through coaching cues. Uh then we 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 kind of build upon that. We have some sessions where we get offensive coordinators, defense coordinators to come in and talk about their philosophy, how they break down film, uh, you know, how they self-scout. You know, I can go down a list of all the different stuff they talk about from a from a uh, coordinator standpoint. Then we get head coaches up there, they talk about how they run a program, they talk about how to leadership, you know, all those different kind of things. And then we have a ton of outside the line stuff, uh, you know, where coaches get on, they talk about, uh, you know, how they, how they use player tracking uh, to, you know, to, to, to keep up with player reps and stuff like that. We have strength and conditioning coaches that come over. Um, and then probably the most important thing, I, you know, it's easy for me to get all, all fired up by the education stuff, but we actually have a ton of business meetings, uh, you know, to where a lot of the NAIA level, the NCAA level, uh, you know, the divisional levels, division three, whatever, they come and they sit down as a collective group of head coaches and they just talk about what 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 issues are affecting them and, you know, put it down on paper and they, they bring it to our board and our board discusses it. And uh, Coach Barry talks with the NCA and tries to educate them on issues that we see with with upcoming rule changes and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a ton going on. We have a humongous tailgate for our national championship game, which uh, with, this, with, with with adding the playoff, um, adding teams to the playoffs, I know everybody's excited about that, but that throws a little bit of a wrench in some of the stuff that we do. But uh, at the very least, this upcoming year with the national championship still falling in line with our convention, um, we are going to – you guess, <laughs> got to get that light yeah, going. Yeah, Coach. I'm in, my, I'm in my classroom, Coach. I got you, man. We got to save energy here in Virginia. <laughs> I feel you, man. Well – yeah. So, anyways, we 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 watch, we watch the uh, the national championship game collectively as a big old group. We provide uh, food, beverages, things like that. And all the coaches just sitting there, and it's you know, I one of the biggest transitions that I had as a as as a former coach and sitting at football games live was I sat in the stands one of my first games. You know, obviously been here in Waco at, at, at a Baylor game, and some fan as we're up, you know, as I say we as a former Baylor Baylor grad, but you know, the Baylor's winning, we're up twenty one zero and. Uh, you know, something like that. And the fan is like, what are we doing? You know, like, you keep calling the same play. And I looked over and I'm like, do you know what play they just ran? You know, do you, what was it? What did they run? I don't know, but they ran it to the right and we keep doing that. And then I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know what? I can't come to these games because I just see football so much differently as, oh, yeah. than, than, than the fans do. And so uh, actually experiencing that tailgate is, is a cool deal because you're sitting there and it's a bunch of guys that understand that that was dark. That wasn't power read. I know the announcer says power read wasn't power read. It was counter read, you know. Um, it was zone dash, you know, whatever. So um, that that's probably one of my favorite things that we've just added in. Um, so it's a ton of networking, a uh, ton of education, ton of business meetings, um, and just opportunity to just, you know, just sit around a bunch of coaches that are not scared to share uh, what they do. Um, and I always think that's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I've said this before, but, you know, there's not a burger convention where McDonald's is telling – Burger King about the secret sauce, you know, or, uh, you know, Burger King's telling Whataburger how to flame broil a burger. You know, it's you know, our profession is special. You know, I'm going to play you on Saturday, but I'm, I don't care. You know, I, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to talk about how we, how we, how we, you know, uh, run our zone, our fire zone blitz, you know, and uh, I, I, I can really appreciate the profession and, and the guys that are willing to speak and the guys that are willing to share, uh, you know, not, not, not safeguarding that information, but been, been willing to 
to share all that information. On the defensive side of the ball, what are the things that coaches come to you and they're trending? Things that they want to hear about people's d defenses, what coaches' defense, what team's defense. What is the future for defensive football? And from what you're hearing, Coach, what, what do coaches want to hear when it comes to the defensive side of the ball? Yeah, um, a, a lot of people have asked here over the last couple of years uh, um, have asked about Iowa State, kind of what Iowa State's doing with the with the three safeties. Um, a lot of a lot of three down line stuff, three 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 stack, uh, three three five, which are some subtle difference between three three stack and the three three, uh, three, three five. Um, at a lot of that stuff, um, it's been a few questions when you start probably getting a little bit more exotic. Um, is 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 uh. I want to say Clemson might have did this a couple of years ago playing LSU uh, in, in the national championship, but uh, some of the two 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 linemen stuff, just having two guys at the line of scrimmage, putting more athletes on the field. It's been a lot of people just kind of asking about that, seeing what kind of film I've seen on that. Um, yeah, that's 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 probably defensively has been, been majority of it, like a lot of the three down line stuff, a lot, and the two down line stuff. If that's even a phrase yet, but uh, that's that's been most of my questions. How about offensively, Coach? What what do people come to you and and want to know about? What are they always talking about? Man, I, you know that one is tough to be honest with you, uh, because I you know I feel like it's been an extended period of time, and I actually did this as a coach myself. Was uh, the the old Baylor or Browns era uh, extended splits, wide split stuff? That's kind of been been the big trend, especially as that. Staff broke up, and all of a sudden you got guys at Tennessee, and Tennessee had a great year. And, you know, you got guys at Arkansas TCU that are, are putting a little bit of a, a flavor of that inside what they're doing offensively. So that's been popular here over the last probably seven or eight years. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people have actually been asking. Once again, this is some some I've done, so I don't. I, sometimes it's hard to delineate the two, but uh, there's some of the, the two quarterback stuff, taking two quarterbacks, putting them on the field at the same time. I've had I've had a lot of coaches kind of want to look at that, just been able to. Put a few more athletes on the field, or even letting a running back, you know, uh, run power read and be able to have the opportunity to throw the ball down the field. So, I've been seeing a bunch of that, but I say that's interesting because uh, it, it, that one, man, I've, I've had coaches, hey, coach, you got some wishbone stuff, you got some of the old Navy 1946 uh, Naval Academy or Air Force Academy stuff. So, it's like, um, you know, a little bit of me, I, I think offenses might be looking to go full circle again. Um, where you're seeing a lot more under center stuff, a lot more old school, you know, belly option and stuff like that. That, you know, I, in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of faded away a little bit. But uh, as, as offenses, as defenses are calling asking about how to cover more spread stuff, you know, maybe, maybe you're seeing more offenses say, hey, how we, how can we take advantage of these guys, you know, playing more, more spread type defenses. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always interesting just seeing the the chess match that's going on between O and D, and uh, you know, just seeing kind of where the game is going to go. So what about special teams? Does anybody care about the kickers? I mean, <laughs> covering yeah. punts, covering kicks. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I, I, the th the thing that's always interesting about that, and I I I, I take I take some pride. I, I'm a, I would say I'm a special teams slash wide receiver guy. If you ask, kind of what my coaching coaching background is, um, is is most people just want to see somebody that does something really really good. And everybody kind of trends to running, 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 whatever that is. And so, uh, you yeah, know, th that one doesn't get as crazy. Um, but definitely, you know, seeing some guys exploring some different ways to, uh, to, to cover kicks, uh, you know, hey, what, what trends are you seeing? You know, a lot of guys are, especially with the, you know, the fair catch rule getting institute. I know it's now in the NFL, so that's a big uh, talk, of, talk of discussion. But, you know, I've been in collegiate level for about five, six years now. A lot of guys just trying to land that ball at the one yard line and making kickoff returners uh, make decisions. You're going to you're going to wait fair catch. You're going to you're going to take it out because it's going to make it tough for you. We're going to pin you in the same corner and we're going to kick it deep left every time. Uh, so I've seen a lot of schools do that. Uh, but yeah, man, it, it, I get so many random questions. It's kind of hard to ball them all up, especially for special teams. Um, and, you know, and, and guys are always. I would definitely say they're always looking to get into our, our, our digital library to learn just more about the technique stuff. Because I always thought that was interesting. I mean, he has a former special teams coordinator when you start talking about deep snap. And I never deep snapped a day in my life. So that was something I had to go and learn, you know, and, and not 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 be able to say, oh, yeah, hey, you know, let me take my personal experience and kind of, kind of give it to you. It was more like 
I had to really go learn how to do something that's not very easy to do and make sure I, I was well equipped to talk to my deep snappers, talk to my holder, talk to my to my kicker and things like that. So uh, always, always getting questions about just technique stuff, about how, how we can keep getting those guys better. You, you mentioned the digital library, Coach. So if a coach is out there and they become a member of the AFCA, the American Football Coaches Association, what does that get them? Yeah, so uh, I would start at the digital library, so that kind of kind of led us there. But uh, you get access to the digital library. So pretty much since I got here, we've started recording every last event that, that kind of awesome. occurs. Um, and we take that and we throw it into a digital library. We don't do much editing to it or anything like that. We just – Say, hey man, look, this is uh, you know, Maurice yeah. Lindquist is the name we said earlier, but it's him talking about DB play and um, just give coach opportunity to maybe you know, we got a lot of stuff that goes on in four days, so sometimes you can't see everything. So, you might have been yeah. there, but weren't able to make it to the session, or you might not have been there, you know, you might not have been able to make it to the convention in, at all. So, just gives coaches a ton of opportunities to uh, to just go and search. You know, it's 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 about as YouTube as as I, as I would hope for, at least at this point, we'd love to get the search. Um, engine maybe a little bit more optimized to where you can go and find some very, very specific stuff a little bit easier. But for the most part, you can go back and, you know, watch a, a ton of stuff. And we had a lot of coaches that are gracious enough to do some digital stuff for us. And so uh, just create a, you know, kind of a PowerPoint presentation, record it online, send it to us. And that's the kind of stuff's in our library. So it's getting more and more robust each year. And I uh, just wanted to get to a point where, you know, even, even if you don't plan to ever come to an AMCA convention, you can, log on, go to our library and say, hey, look, I can find something here that's going to make me a better coach. Um, but as far as everything else, obviously, you get uh, you get opportunity to come to the convention as a member. Uh, you see a magazine, which we put out uh, by monthly, I think, at this point. We might we might transition here. I, I think it's by monthly, yeah. We've got a bi monthly magazine that comes out. Um, uh, you get the opportunity to vote on coaches of the year, uh, things like that. That's kind of, kind of important. Um, and then, you know, we're working on continue to try to build some stuff to make some more networking opportunities, maybe maybe from with on the back side of the computer so you can log in and have a Facebook or Twitter type experience, but just amongst the coaching profession. But you know that's that kind of stuff is in the works. And there's a few more little little things that uh you know that you get as a member, but those kind of the meat and potatoes of it. What podcasts do you listen to, coach? Are there any? <laughs> you know what, man? Uh no, I don't. That sound that sound that sounds bad, man. Uh, I I typically don't like. I don't I don't recruit anymore. Um, I live thirteen minutes from my house. Yeah, it's not uh, a long commute. Yeah, so it's, it's just not. I'm, I'm not in the car very much to sit down and listen to a podcast. And if I'm not listening to Frozen or uh, Moana having two daughters, you know, all the Disney movie stuff, I, I'm at home. That's that's pretty much what I'm listening to. So um, I know there's a ton of tremendous people doing some great stuff from an educational standpoint. So I definitely don't want to pass over that that point. That uh, man, there's there's great stuff out there. Um, unfortunately, like I said I just yeah. I just don't sit down. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, Coach. Yeah, yeah, no, it's I respect good, your honesty. I would have, <laughs> but you know, I, I probably would have made something up, but then I would have been an idiot and said something wrong. And like, that's not even a real podcast. <laughs> so, are there any books, football books? Um, a coach asked me, Coach, do I have to read books in order to be a good coach? Like, yeah. are there any books that you would recommend? Any of your favorites or Man, anything that yeah. jumps out? <laughs> that, that is two tough questions. And, and, and this is something, you know, you asked me earlier about what I've learned about, about coaches, man. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I get on, there's some of these very, like, deep coaches that they get up in the morning, they read every morning. Uh, other coaches that get up and they do their podcast every morning, they got a podcast that they listen to, whether it's Inside Headset, you know, whether it's you, whether it's whoever it is. You know, they got their podcast that they listen to. And it's some people that just, they don't they do not do either. And I, I was always kind of one of those guys that I hate saying it. I didn't do a ton of reading, but – uh. You know, as far as my development as a coach, my development as a professional, man, it's like this. I, if I pick the phone up, I call guys. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I visited tons of staffs. Um, going down to Houston Baptist here soon to go, um, you know, see their new staff that they just put together down there. Um, you know, Houston Baptist, Houston Christian actually just rebranded their their school. So sorry for the shout out, <laughs> Coach Harris. But uh, but yeah, you know, so I'm I'm, I'm definitely the type of guy. That, probably a little bit more like get up and go sit in the building, go get up on the board with the guy and just, uh, you know, kind of have those type of talks. I, I'm definitely huge on that kind of the get togethers that were a little bit more popular during COVID, you know, where a group of coaches get on and say, Hey man, 
<laughs> hop on the Zoom link at 6.30. We're going to get on and we're going to talk about inside zone. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more of that type of guy. So I hate I had to shut down two questions from a podcast and book standpoint. That, that just it's just not who I am. And there's, in my opinion, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. I think uh, we all learn different ways. You know, I think any good teacher kind of knows that um, we all learn different ways. And, you know, and that's just kind of how I am. And if you're a book person, man, please, that underneath, it, you know, where, where yeah, I'm not, I'm not a from. book. I'm not a book person. Coach. <laughs> yeah. I watch a video. I'll watch a movie. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you I'm, go. A, I'm a YouTube guy. Yeah, exactly, yes. man. So I mean, the, the, the cool thing is, regardless of what kind of person that you are, in 2023, man, the, the resources are out there. You know, the books are out there, they're accessible. You, you buy them online, have them immediately, immediately via ebooks. You know, if you're a podcast guy, you know, you, you can find them via Twitter or, you know, just searching the Apple, Apple podcast th- uh, places and things like that. And if you're like yourself, you know, you get on YouTube, you're looking for something you search for. It. And uh, if you're like myself, I just pull a Rolodex is not a thing anymore, but, you know, pull out the phone and roll through contacts and, you know, call guys and find answers. Yeah, Coach. I mean, it it's amazing. Like, I, I never been big on Twitter. But oh, man, really? There, no, I mean, I had Twitter and everything, but I really didn't look at, like, football stuff on Twitter. Yeah. Like, I would never talk about football, really, with anybody. Right. But there is a huge Twitter community of right. coaches and, you know, Coach McNally, the one thing I did do, Coach, is I helped get Coach McNally on Twitter. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm the coach that did that. And, That's awesome. you know, it, it was awesome. And talk about Twitter, Coach, and, you know, there can be a lot of educational opportunities on Dude, Twitter. Absolutely, man. Uh, I, I was kind of always one of the – social media guys on all the staffs that I had worked on. And uh, so I was, I was early, early kind of, kind of guy in, into the Twitter, Twitter world, especially from a coaching standpoint. I was always, uh, I was always intrigued with how we were able to connect. Um, and, and man, it's grown so much from that standpoint to the point where it's like, I, mean, I, I get the opportunity to talk to some young coaches at the time. I'm like, if you don't have a Twitter, I just don't even know how you can be in a profession, you know, from 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 regardless of what what you know what position that you're in as a high school coach is such an easy way to get in contact with co- collegiate coaches in, in regards to recruiting and vice versa. Uh, awesome opportunity to stay connected. What's going on with your kids? And then for like you said, from an education standpoint, um, man, I you know I, I would hop on. I did so many of the the little uh, hashtag chats. I don't know if they still exist anymore. Yeah, they do. Hog, hog football chat. You know, mm-hmm. just down there and done a few of these from an AFCA standpoint. Did a couple of them when I was a. Uh, I was a receiver coach at Louisiana Monroe, and uh, you know this is just such an easy opportunity. And since then, you know, since I've been out the profession, you know, people with so much access to film, um, you know, one of my favorite things. Like I said, I'm a receiver guy. So I love getting on. I can't remember the name of the, tw- the tweet account, but it's a uh, like football uh, receiver drill, <laughs> whatever that tweet Twitter account is, and I get on there, and it's just you know uh, cut ups of guys from all different levels just rolling through a receiver drill, and I'm. I roll through and I'm never critical on absolutely anything. That's, I would say that's my one complaint right now with Twitter. I think there's a lot of a lot of complaining or you know t- talking bad about somebody's <laughs> drills and stuff like that. And I, I I I actually I can't stand that part of it. But you know just to hop on there and say, oh, this is a drill I like. I don't care for this drill. This is a drill that's cool. This is a drill that you know. Hey, if I get some opportunity to work with my my student athletes, I'm I, I'm still in coaching just a little bit here at the moment, but. Uh, you know, and just a great resource, man. And if you if you want to find it, it's there. It's there on social media. So yeah, I mean, I'm happy you mentioned that because that's, that's something. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you about some receiver stuff, coach. Okay. Like, as a receiver coach, what do you hang your hat on? Like, what is the most important thing? <laughs> that's a question that I've gotten probably more times than you would ever imagine. And uh, <laughs> you know, I I. I, I I definitely would say the top of the route. I've uh, been able to release at the top of the route. But uh, you know, that's something that probably if you looked at my drill work, that's where I spent a lot more of my time showing guys how to uh, get all contact, um, how to set guys up at the top of the route, you know, rolling through, uh, you know, how to stick a foot at the top of the route versus speed, you know, the, the, the speed cut versus hard cut, you know, things like that. Um, but, you know, a lot, a lot of times I, I, I tend to – be a little bit more sarcastic in my response and say, why do I have to hang my hat on on one thing? And and, and it is a great question. So I'm, I'm I'm definitely not going there with it. But man, I, I you know I, I just think there's so many great ways to make a wide receiver better. You know, between 
a release, you know, winning at the line of scrimmage, you know, how you work your stem, you know, always posing a vertical threat, um, blocking like no other, you know, so it's, 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 there's so much to it. It's like, you ask me on Tuesday, I might say a different answer. I, it typically, it's, it's always going to be top of the round. It's kind of my, my thing if you ask me that question. But, man, it's just so many ways to polish receivers. Um, and, 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 man, I had some guys that were just tremendous at the top of the route, but didn't necessarily have a great release off the line of scrimmage and, you know, be able to up their game from that standpoint. But, uh, you know, I think anybody that can really win on the top of the route has a great chance, but guys that are willing to put the work in just to be well-rounded are always going to be the ones that are better, which is common sense, but uh, always worth saying whenever I get that answer. You, you always hear these coaches, though, I say, catch the ball. Like, what's the specific things a coach could say? You know, I mean, we, we don't have an instance here, but, I mean, I, I yeah. do have football. But, I mean, what yeah, are yeah, yeah. they can say other than just catch the ball? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, something you got to be careful what you say. But, uh, you know, I grew up kind of throwing the noose, you know, creating the creating noose. Yeah. And uh, I've used the term diamond web. Talked about, uh, you know, hand positioning when catching in a certain way. Uh, that was that was that was that was actually a huge coaching point for me as a young coach. Man, I was fortunate enough to have uh, worked for a guy named Aaron Pelch. He was the head coach of Millsaps for a long time, and now he's athletic director there. And uh, you know, I was a young young receiver coach, and I was out there and we threw a ball, and my receiver dropped, and I yell out, "Catch the ball!" And my 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 uh, head head coach was a phenomenal dude, but like from the start of practice into practice. Start of a game, the end of the game, he was an absolute maniac. He was just so intense. And, man, he comes over, he's like, you know, I think he knows that he needs to catch the ball. Like, give him some detail. And, you know, in the moment, I'm like, oh, shit, you know, I'm getting chewed out. But it was such a – it was a pivotal moment in my career because, like, I never said catch the ball again. It was like you, like kind of kind of the point you're getting at was, you know, speaking about this specific hand position. Hey, hey you know, guys are running across from trying to catch – they flip your hands over. You know, just just little, little, little coaching cues that they hear me say, you know, redundantly you know just repeatedly uh you know transitioning transitioning that that verbiage in, into something that can be a little bit more conducive and productive you know pinkies and pinkies you know uh, thumb, thumbs and thumbs and pointers you know uh yeah, tons of little things for each of the types of catches that come in so um yeah i'm happy you said that i'm happy you mentioned that, that was a huge <laughs> huge day in my coaching career uh coach for the coaches that are out there, like the high school coaches that, that may be watching this or going to watch it, Coach, what, what do you have to say to them? Oh, man. Uh, and you, you already said it, but, I mean, I'm, I, yeah. if you have something else that's on your heart. But, yeah, man. I, I, I mean, but you have your own podcast, Coach, where you talk to coaches all the time. So, I mean. Yeah, man. Uh, but, no, it's important. Like, I'm, ha I'm happy you asked the question. And, uh, man, what they do is probably – way more important than ever they never will never get enough credit from uh you know from anybody for, for what they do i i think you see these polished products that show up on the draft or you know in the nfl or you know colleges and man all these stem from great programs great coaches that uh you know taught them how to catch their first balls you know taught them how how to stem taught them some of the stuff that we're talking about right now um you know the reality of it is is like you know, you know, most college coaches are going to go sign a kid that is is. And I don't want to necessarily say that's ready to go, uh, but but is ready to go. I'm gonna come fine tune you up. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I think I think the credit goes to the you know, the higher the level, the higher you know whatever from a financial standpoint, they're getting paid like crazy and they, they get all the notoriety. But from what a high school coach does, what my high school coaches did for me, um, I don't think they could never ever give enough credit. Um, you know, for get, get enough credit for it. Um, and, and, and I kind of echo what I said at the beginning of the podcast. What, what you do is important. What you do is important. How you interact with every last kid from the, you know, from, from your star player to the last man on the roster. Um, and you just make sure that you realize how impactful your words are, um, your direction, your leadership is. Um, you know, and all these guys get you on know, podcasts, I ask them why they get into coaching. And uh, I mean, 90% of them can go back to a middle school or high school coach that spent that extra minute with them, you know, said that extra thing to them. And, uh, you know, it, what you do is important. Yeah. So, you know, it just popped in my mind. What are some things and, you know, th this, this might be the last question. It might not cause I don't want to keep you all day, but no, good, what are some things about our game that bother you? What are some things about our game that you would like to see fixed? 
Like yeah. some people say, you know, it's the all the guys wearing all the rubber bracelets, the players, you know, and, mm. you know, the I got 47 offers or the transfer portal or whatever yeah. it is, the NIL. What, what is it that bothers you, Coach, or you think needs to be improved with our yeah. game? I mean, you're at a – you have a very big role, Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, it, <laughs> I'm probably like one of the most uh, back and forth answers, like ride the fence type guys you'll probably get on a podcast. Not that I'm not passionate about my answers, but it's like, you know, I don't want to say the NIL directly. And to be honest with you, I hear a lot of coaches say, man, this is, this is wrong. These coaches, these guys shouldn't be getting paid. I, I don't know if I completely stand on that side of the fence either. I, I, I just think it needs – right now it just needs to be in a better place to where – it makes sense. It's not driving the transfer portal. It's not driving college kids' decisions. Um, but, you know, college kids can go and they can, you know, make a little money and something reasonable and uh, not not be so driven off that. So, like, the NIL, it needs to, there needs to be some betterment uh, to, to, to the current situation. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, I definitely wouldn't say, hey, guys shouldn't be paid or they should be getting paid way more. You know, I'm definitely not there. Um, you talk about the transfer portal. I transferred. I transferred from Army. Um, I see a lot of kids get beat up saying uh, they don't want to compete. I wanted to compete. I, I started as a true freshman, <laughs> you know, at, at the Division One level. And uh, I moved to a situation where I didn't even get to go start. It took me a long time to kind of break the depth chart and start and start at Baylor. Um, so there, there are college kids that are in the transfer portal right now because they're, they're, they're homesick, because they made a decision that, you know, maybe, maybe at the time wasn't, wasn't the best decision, you know, when, when, when they look back on it. I was that guy. So um, I do think I do think there's every kid that transferred isn't a bad kid. Uh, but there's definitely a ton that are, you know, leveraging, you know, to transfer into to, to better opportunities. There's definitely kids that are transferring because they don't want to compete. Um, so, yeah, once again, like I'm on the fence on it, but I have an opinion. I just think um, you know, I, I will say I'm happy uh, that that kids can transfer and they don't have to at least lose the eligibility immediately. That was something I had to deal with. I think the Lord played as a true freshman because I was able to redshirt, not lose any any time. But you know, for a long time, there's kids that couldn't do that uh, without dropping a level. So um, yeah, man, I you know, I, 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 th- th- there's problems everywhere. I think everything could be better. I don't think there's one red button topic for me. I think uh, you know, from a coaching standpoint, I think there's way too many guys that are able to kind of create a platform and then declare themselves an expert. You know, guru, Coach Price. You know, like. Man, and, you know, yeah, you guru. Be a great coach in I had a guy, I saw a guy's Twitter said offensive guru. <laughs> right. Oh, he yeah. Must, he must have never actually called plays because <laughs> he will be humbled eventually. Absolutely, man. And I think, uh, you know, once again, our players watch, they, they see how we act. And I, you got to be confident. You have to know your stuff. Don't get me wrong. I think I'm a great receivers coach, but I, I just said, I, I literally am on that Twitter almost every day, just looking at what drills can help me be a, become a better coach. And I don't even, I, you know, like I said, I barely, barely coach, you know, to the, even that level anymore. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think as coaches, we can definitely humble ourselves and, uh, you know, continue to try to be green, uh, you know, always seeking more knowledge, always trying to find that podcast, that book, you know. that yeah, Lifelong that, learners. That call, we want you know, lifelong, lifelong learners. learners. Absolutely. Never declare ourselves in that manner. Um, you know, I, I've never been big on what, what student athletes wear. Um, yeah, and I know some coaches yeah. are passionate and create some really good reasons on that stuff and, you know, more power to you. That's not something that really grinds my gears. But uh, you know, as long as you're able to teach kids the true value of the game, um, you know, being a team player, you know, uh, learning the traits of determination, discipline, you know, all, you know, all those kind of kind of kind of core values that you kind of get from playing a game. I think, uh, you know, some of that stuff becomes least imp- a little less important to me than, than, than being able to teach them that part of the game. If they're making it all about themselves and they're not able to absorb the, the values, and yeah, uh, that definitely uh, becomes a, becomes a factor. But yeah, man, I, you know, absolutely. Right now, our, our game is not in a not not in a perfect place, and I don't think it ever has. I don't think it ever will be. But you know, much like you know, much like anything else, you know, we got to keep chopping wood. We got to keep trying to find a way to crack the code, and the code is never cracked. You know, just trying to find a way to, to better our game, better ourselves. You know, better what kind of leaders we are, better our student athletes, making them make making sure that they walk out, whether they're champions or not, they're walking out and they're gonna be a champion in life, be great husbands, be great fathers, all those kind of things. Yeah, I, I can think of one thing, coach, that really bothers me. Guys getting kicked out over targeting. I mean, I can see if you do it once, like yeah. these guys are not intentionally trying to hurt people like we did when I played. Yeah. All right. Jack Tatum, Ronnie Lott, like, 
accidents happen. Yeah. But, like, to kick a kid out of the game because of one hit and then, yeah. like, I think it should be, like, okay, 15-yard penalty. All right, if the kid gets another 15-yard penalty, then kick him out. Yeah. But, like, what, is there anything that they're doing to change that? You know, they made, they made a, slight, a slight change, which uh, still doesn't quite clean it up. But the, the slight change was they just didn't have to do the walk of shame anymore where you literally – Got, got, got a targeting call. It's the stupidest rule ever. Ripped the helmet off and walked the kid off the field. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, and that, that's probably something. That, that, why don't we? Why don't we go back to that's a fifteen yard penalty? Yeah. Okay, they get another fifteen yard penalty. Kick them out. Right. Yeah. It, you know, I, I think I think um, you know, as me and you talk about it as two sensible coaches, it make it makes a ton of sense for it to be like that. I think if that was the rule, I think the message will still get hammered home. But uh, yeah. you know, the, the, the game was under attack and probably still is um, to a very oh, serious extent I got from, from a safety standpoint. And uh, once again, I'm not I'm not saying this is the reason why it's, it's like that and it should be like that. But I think the most important thing whenever they were sitting down making that happen like that way, it was like, hey, we want to make a point. You don't need to be lowering your head. We don't want to see guys breaking their necks. We don't want to see concussions. We yeah. don't want – these lawsuits popping back out years later. And so I think that was the overreaction to, to that in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that a, a, guy, a guy got ejected because, it, hey, if you want to play, yeah. you to keep your head up. And so, uh, once again, I'm, I'm definitely I'm definitely not for that. I hate I hate that for kids. I, I think I've seen yeah, too many one games. play, they're done. I mean, one it's play, like it changes the game. It changes I the mean, game. And uh, you start talking, you know, uh, you see it happen. I want to say it was, it was some game I was watching here. Uh, over oh, over, yeah. Christmas, over Christmas break, it was every you know, game. It was just, it was just every game. Monument. There's probably one person kicked out. Absolutely. It's unbelievable. And it's a monumental game. You're like, man, you know, you really stripped that opportunity from that kid. It, you know, you bring it back and say, well, the, the kid stripped the opportunity from himself because it's a rule and, and we know it exists. But uh, and you know, I, I think if I wanted to probably get a little bit more teed off about it, I, I, I would I would think I'm an offensive guy, so you know this must mean something. Um, but oftentimes you see running backs. I play running back in college, man, and you, you see those guys lower to hell, and they go and yeah. bring the contact to guys, and you see how easily a, a kind of a launch point can change. You're going in there trying to avoid head to head, you're putting your head at the chest level, and the guy balls up, and next thing you know, it's head to you know head to head contact. And I think, uh, you know, I, 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 what would it hurt? I, I don't care if the game thirty seconds longer, but like, let's get that right. Let's uh, let's make sure that you're not getting guys kicked out because yeah, you can tell when it's intentional right i mean at least we can yeah but then again you, referees you like, right you like to feel like you can i know in real time they got a hard job um, are referees but, are referees what? allowed to be in the association uh yes yeah we we have some memberships that allow for people that are are not necessarily coaches in the apartment association oh, okay because we have an association in richmond that the officials are the head of it it's kind of like a you know, small, like a, you know, like a touchdown club type thing, but yeah. the officials are in it with the coaches. So I, I, I'm against it. I don't think officials should be in coaches associations. So no, I, well, I, I'm not on, I'm not on the fence on that one, coach. <laughs> all right. I'm the most penalized coach of all time. Yeah. Put yeah that in Waco. Know, I, I, you know, I, you could probably look at that a bunch of different ways. And I'm sure from your way, yeah, like you said, you're a no go, but, uh, I mean, I, I think it's just some opportunity for some great dialogue. I mean, I, I think uh, I think oftentimes we lose sight of how hard of a job that referees have. Uh, yes, we, we do, and uh, you know, I, I I think you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying you're gonna get a group of guys together in a room and gonna talk about it and all of a sudden everything is gonna be clear because once again, they have a hard job. We have a hard job as coaches. Um, you know, we're, we're uber competitive. Um, Oftentimes yes. we're arguing with referees about holding calls and you go back and watch the film, and you're like, damn, that, that was that was holding. Um and oftentimes you look and it wasn't. Um, but you know, I, I you know, I just think some good dialogue. I actually spent some time with the um you it was the USA football. Yeah, USA football put together some some referee stuff because right now it's kind of in a crisis. It was a it, it hit, it yeah. hit uh, Texas pretty pretty hard. Uh um, I know just here locally, been able to find refs for games, and uh, it was also yep. an issue in some of the lower level college games. And you know, it, the big thing was a lot of a lot, a lot of referees that were there at that at the kind of uh, consortium were uh, were talking about, man, I get my head chewed off from the parents and from the coach, and like I just said, man, 
I'm gonna hang it up. And so, don't get me wrong, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get too soft on them, but uh, you know, it just gave me some perspective on you know, kind of, kind of, kind of what these guys are trying to do at, at real time, game speed, no slow motion, none of that kind of stuff. So, it's it's a tough gig, man. But uh, yes, it's tough. But I, I I think in 2023, all the advancement in technology that we've seen, it would be nice to see some type of technology that lets lets us be more right than wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, f- from a referee standpoint. So games, I mean, I, I I think we could all agree that we just want it to be called right, whether yeah. it's my guy getting the, the, the whole yes. call or the target call. We just want it to be right. And um, that that's that's probably the biggest thing i love to see. It's just the game improve from that standpoint. Right yeah, call. Coach, I, I took an hour of your time, Coach. We sat here and just two coaches talking. But is there anything else, Coach, that you would like to say that we didn't cover? Before we sign off, because I like to I like to press in and pick your brain just for a little bit, Coach. Yeah, Keep man. Um, no, man. I, I think we covered everything. Like I said, man. Uh, you know, anybody that's listening to this, is, you know, if you're a current coach, once again, I hammer home one more time. You know, what you do is important. We appreciate you. I'd love for you to be a part of our association. Uh, you can learn more about us afca.com. Uh, feel please feel free to give us a, co- a follow on Twitter. We are afca. Um, or give myself personally a, a little follow on Twitter uh, at Coach Mario Price. Um, give me a shout, shoot me a DM. Uh, I, I, I'm not as savvy as I used to be on Twitter. I'm not on it every day, but uh, within a few days, I definitely respond to every message I get. Um, you guys are not just important to those young people. You're important to me. Uh, I appreciate everybody out there that um, you know takes their time to pour into these young people and uh, continue to make the game the game as great as it is right now. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate you. I'm going to press in. I'm going to pick your brain a little bit. All right.